seats. I would like to thank you all for being here today at the Infrastructure Engineering for Stack Conference 2015. As a GIS committee, we have had the privilege of working together with the department in organizing this committee, and I would like to thank the department for that. And before I go, I would like to remind you all to vote for the presentations online through this website. Even if you have missed the morning sessions, you can still go back to the uh, links and vote for the presentations that you have attended. Uh, now I'd like to welcome, invite Professor Abbas Shadar before our head of department to officially welcome this presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning and very warm welcome to all of you to our 2015 postgraduate conference. Particularly, I would like to take the opportunity to welcome your industry colleagues and in particular our keynote speaker, uh, Brandon Drissel Cole. And uh, we are very delighted to have you, Brandon, here and we're really looking forward to your talk today. And also, I would like to take the opportunity to welcome in, uh, those of you that are attending for the first time here. This is a very important component of our uh, activities in our department, and in particular with regard to our quality of our RHD training side. So we take this one as a serious side, and we get also the opportunity to learn what's going on across the department, as well as also uh, perhaps providing the input into the direction of the research side. And what we define ourselves as a department, as an intensive and also a, a diverse area related to infrastructure and your uh, topics and the program that you have is proving that is the case for us. I would like to also thank our organizing committee, which they have done a wonderful job and I believe that we have already actually received to this with the first session that we have already gone through that uh, and now coming to the, um, the plenary session and then following again with the parallel session in that sense side. Currently, uh, we have 120 RHC uh, research higher degree students in our department. And this year, we are going to have around 22 completion of the RHC and also a similar number actually addition to our department, which we are really very really delighted. And in fact, in line with our growth strategic plan, which is going to be 50% growth in our staff over the next five years, and in addition to that fund is going to be the growth across the students and other uh, activities of the department side. But the maintaining of these uh, incoming students and also outgoing students with the quality outcomes that they can actually be prepared to start uh, working with the industry is our main focus of our activities. Uh, so I, I would like to thank all the staff and also all those who have helped uh, this event as well as also in the arrangement and the input into the research into the, uh, all the project by RHC side, which are the part of the engine of the department side. And also the topic, the themes of the conference is again very in line with our strategic plan as well as also our growth plan, which uh, you have heard several occasions about our directions and the new areas of the work of our departments, which we're going to also uh, I mean, hiring a, a new staff into those domains, as well as also students coming to work in those domains that we then have a complete actual picture to contribute in the infrastructure engineering side of that. And uh, another angle is that, uh, again, uh, we take this very serious because you coming actually to working with industry and in the engagement with industry is the very crucial component for us and we need to make sure that we understand the needs of the industry, we put together the direction that we can actually deliver the next generation of practitioners in that same side. So by this, I would like to, uh, first of all, again, welcome you back and to the conference and also uh, thanking the organizing committee and all the people actually involved in this arrangement with us and have a great actually day, which we already started with that one. And please participate in inputting into any part of the presentation side and also enjoying your day. Thank you very much and again, well and welcome. Thank you, Professor Abbas. Now I'd like to invite 
Associate Professor Dr. Nelson Lam, the Department ISD Coordinator, for the opening. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to uh, also make my own observations that uh, this conference has been around for 50 years and I could see year by year there has been fine-tuning, there has been continuous improvement. And so what we have been doing is actually make use of the experience on the conference uh, for one year and at the end we have a wrapping up session which summarize the strength and weakness of each occasion and then make improvement for the following year. So this is why at the end of today, we have got Professor Stephen Winter chairing uh, the feedback sessions. But since this is a leader of the day, I'd like to also make my own um, observations on um, uh, one of the sessions which I've been sitting around in uh, session A over there, that uh, the timing is very, very tight uh, for all the presentations because uh, our aim is to really give everyone the opportunity to, exp to make presentations, but then the only five minutes or to ten minutes are available, then I can actually see that there have been some sort of race with time, with some representations, that, uh, that as the uh, chair actually raised five minutes and two minutes, then the speakers uh, actually speed up the speech. Um, in all that, um, that everything that is meant to be delivered is delivered. But in fact, you can always have a second thought about it, is that while you don't think that you can really reasonably finish the presentations, you could say, well, uh, um, ladies and gentlemen, so could I simply just skip a few slides and come to the key points of presentation? And uh, some presentations I'm very, very impressed because there are very few writings on it and they are very succinct and to the point. But there are still some presentations which are very few that we text, so we can't really do too much about it because it's already uh, right in the middle of the conference, but you may always make the decision in the middle of presentation to cut back some of the slides in order that you actually hammer on the key points. So this is uh, some minor feedback I'd like to really contribute to, but we will have a more lengthy discussion at the end of the day. Yeah. Thanks very much. Now I'd like to call on um, Professor Andrew Weston to talk about the best of the Okay, thanks. Um, we're going to have a, a slight rearrangement of the program in the sense that we've decided we'll present or we'll do all the awards presentation in one hit at the end of the day, um, rather than separating out the best papers and the best presentation. Um, but I did want to just say a, a few brief words about why we are actually having best papers and best presentations awards today. Clearly, you can sit at your desk, go in the lab, etc., and do lots of great research, but until you tell someone else about it, it's really of little value. So one of the really key things for um, us to recognise today is the, the really good examples of communicating work. So the best General paper prize is partly about that, and the best presentation prizes also today are about that. So um, those skills are obviously really critical. Uh, I've already seen some great presentations and great slides, sets, etc. today. So let's um, continue on with that, and we'll recognise all that um, excellent presentations and excellent papers at the end of today. Now I'd like to introduce Mr. Brendan Driscoll from Melbourne, Melbourne Metro Rail Authority. This will be the largest project in Australia for the next 10-15 years, and this will also affect Melbourne University as we get a station close to us. Brendan is the Director of Project Strategy for the Authority, and prior to this position, he was the Director of Engineering for the 4 billion regional rail link project, which has completed successfully. I would like to welcome him. Thank you. Good morning everyone. Um, firstly, it's uh, very exciting to be here today. It's um, obviously uh, a well-run conference and it's good to be here and I'm very 
we're excited about the project, so we're happy to, to get out into the community, into the knowledge precincts, and actually um, highlight the benefits to Melbourne of the project. So firstly, um, I'd uh, like to acknowledge um, Priyan for um, um, getting me here today, and um, Professor Abbas, and um, we also do a lot of work um, through government with Colin Duckfield, so uh, we're, we're, uh, Colin's very well known to us, and um, he's a great advocate of the work that we do. So firstly, Melbourne Metro. Uh, Melbourne Metro is a nine to $11 billion project. It's um, had a little bit of a history, but it's really gathering momentum. The Melbourne Metro Rail Authority is the authority uh, set up by government in order to deliver the project. The authority is now completely uh, mobilised. We, we have, with our technical advisors, our commercial advisors, our team, ourselves, we've, we've got a team of 450 people working on this project right now, except for me on here. And um, it's, it's really, really gathering steam. You'll see a lot of uh, community consultation going on at the moment. There's a lot of news a lot of press, and it, it's a very positive project, we're, we're very excited about it. Projects, the great projects, usually are solving a big problem, a tough problem or a challenge. And, and this project, it's got a doozy. Really, the, the, the problem Melbourne is facing is population growth is marching on. You can see the growth rates there. Um, 4 billion to 8 billion by 2051. This is equivalent of a city of Canberra every year pretty much coming to Melbourne. It really is a significant challenge. That just demonstrates where the growth is likely to happen uh, between now and 2031. Much of the growth actually happens, this is a bit of a problem here, but yep. A lot of the growth happens out in the west, where you can see Melbourne's sort of, that grey area is showing the distribution of population. You can see it's quite skewed to the southeast, traditionally has been so. And there's, although there is growth in the southeast and, and the central, as we infill development, somewhat in the east, the real big ticket item is to the north and west. And that's, that will do a lot of the heavy lifting for the growth of Melbourne in the coming decades. The nature of our job market in Melbourne is changing substantially. So it's not just a picture of population growth, it's, it's, it's a change, the city is changing, the economics are changing. What we're finding is that the contributor of manufacturing, which has been traditionally a large base for the city of Melbourne, indeed Victoria, is decreasing. Uh, it's a huge, it still is a huge employer in absolute terms of of Victorians. However, as the economy is changing, it's uh, financial, it's the, the, the knowledge and the technology, health, education, that's the sector, that's the, the those technology based research. That is the sector really that Melbourne is pitching itself to and it competes very well in the international stage. As a consequence of those changes, where people want to go and get around this city changes, the dynamics change from jobs that were quite often in the east and out in the west in the manufacturing sector, not necessarily necessitating people having to commute to the city to get to their jobs as we become a more knowledge-based economy, the need for people to get to the city continues to grow. Our network, the rail network. Melbourne has what it's called uh, a spoken hub network. Basically, we have a city loop, which you can see in the red there, and we have a number of radial lines that come out from that in, in spoke fashion. As a consequence, that city loop does constrain how many trains we can get on our spokes. With population growth, with the changing nature of the jobs and the employment opportunities in Melbourne, 
so too does the rail network patronage continue to increase. And you, you can see there from uh, 100, 100 million patronage in just 2000, it's, it's doubled between now and 2015. And if you actually go back into the 80s in Melbourne, the rail network was starting to decay. People thought that the patronage was dropping and continued to do so probably almost since the 50s with the advent of our freeway system and, and roads and cars. And that change has obviously started to reverse and it happened around 2000. And it followed, it's following international trends in that regard and there's just absolutely no reason that that won't continue. Indeed, it'll, it'll probably uh, accelerate. Uh, the reasons, of course, are the ones we spoke about, population growth, where the jobs are, road congestion. It's interesting to note, if you look and you, and you can sort of research this on Big Rose websites and interrogate data and that, but basically the motor vehicle trips to the city in the peak hour every day on the arterial freeway system has all that plateaued for over a decade. It, it grows ever marginally, but it's basically constrained. And the people getting to the CBD in the last decade, the growth that has occurred has largely happened through infill development, uh, walk up if you like, cycling to some extent, but trams and trains are doing that heavy lifting and, and trains particularly so. The project itself, it, it's, it's got a, it has been around for a while. Uh, so Rod Eddington initially mooted the concept Back in 2008, the governments, the various governments, uh, consecutive governments since that time, have also been looking at strategic planning of, of the development of Melbourne's transport system. And Public Transport Victoria also have a, a document in the public domain, which, which is their network development plan, which is, although it's not a government document, it's, a, it's an authority document from public transport, it shows how they would like the rail network to develop subject to government funding in decades to come. The network hasn't been static. Uh, we have seen expansion on the network since about 2000. Uh, Sunbury, electrification of lines to Sunbury. Clifton Hill has had some increases uh, to, to get better signalling solutions there. And Regional Rail Link was a project that I did for six years before this project, and it, it was a $4 billion project, so it was a huge expenditure. Uh, the federal government contributed $3 billion to that, the state government $1 billion. And that is a major precursor. Without that project, we couldn't be delivering Melbourne Metro today. So in conjunction with Melbourne Metro project, the government has also announced that they will extend Mernda, so the 